I've been living out of cars since I was, I guess, 23. Actually, really, when I was 21, um, I went around the country in in um, two vans with nine other people for a month in January. Uh, it happened to be between my uh, the two semesters of my senior year of college. And I loved it so much that I just decided that what I wanted to do for the rest of my life was just to travel around. So right after graduating from college, I uh, got in a van with two other guys and two dogs, and we drove from Cape Cod to San Francisco, and uh, where we eventually split up. And I hung out in San Francisco, in, in Berkeley, actually, for, for about a month and a half. And then I, I hitchhiked cross-country for the first time. Uh, jumping trains. That was the first time I jumped a train. And uh, that was really wonderful. Um, but it wasn't... I didn't buy my first car when I lived on it until... Um, two years later, 1982, I think. My first car was a Volkswagen 412, blue, metallic blue. I bought it for $400, and it lasted for eight months. And in that time, I, I you know, lived out of it all, in my hometown all summer, and travel around, around a little bit and um, then I told it. Oh well. Um, until last year I have only owned Volkswagens. Um, probably more than 25. And the thing is I've never actually sold a car. I've, I've always uh, um, given them away or <laughs> drove them into the crowd. Um, my first bus I bought in uh, Florida in, in the Keys for $2,000. It was a 1978 uh, um, Westphalia camper van, diarrhea green. And I, I'd always meant to paint it um, the color of the of the color of yellow that they paint the streets with. And I, I once had like a gallon of that paint in my hand in the store, and I kind of talked myself out of getting it at that moment, and uh, never came close to it again. But every bus after that was either blue, or I painted it yellow. <laughs> And I've had, I think, six Volkswagen buses after that. But I, that first Diary of Green one, I, I ended up painting it like I would write whenever I'd have a brainstorm, whatever uh, profound statement came to me, I would paint it on the bus. So it was, the, the bus itself became like a, uh, an ever-changing uh, canvas of, um, of my brain farts. And I tried to keep it, you know, really conscious thoughts, you know, high vibe we were going for. And it seemed to have worked because only on, on only two other occasions were, did I find anybody trying to add their nonsense to my, to my canvas. And I would find people reading my bus at like, you come out of a rest area, bathroom, and there's people reading your bus, the supermarket or something. So you must be doing something right, you know, I figured. And be, when you live out of a vehicle, you see the world through that vehicle. And you think that people, when they see you, they're seeing what 
your vehicle re represents, right? And then when you ride in somebody else's vehicle, you forget that people can't quote unquote see you, you know? And when you move on from that vehicle, it's like, oh, I'm not wearing that, I'm not wearing my costume, you know? So. This right there, in case you're wondering, is uh, from, um, it looks like it, it's a, uh, a side effect of um, this uh, cancer treatment drug that I'm taking. And uh, somehow I got really dehydrated and, you know, it, it, takes, um, it takes a lot longer to, for things to heal. Can. And uh, this has been around for a while. Confession. It's a part of me, um, admittedly egotistical part of me, that gets my my dander up when I whenever I see the hashtag van life. <laughs> uh, and I see you know these young couples and they're they're hustling and they're sprinter vans around the country trying to, um, you know, uh, uh, cater to their following to finance their trip and all that. And, you know, I admit, part of me is like, because um, I have been living on vehicles since, for 40 years. First vehicle I lived out of was uh, before this Dodge Dart, and back in 1981, um, I took care of my brother, who was six years younger, younger than me. He was he was 16, but looked like he was 11. He was one of you know one of those late bloomers, and uh, which worked really well for getting into like movie theaters and stuff, but. The driving, but he wasn't too excited about it because he was at least a foot shorter than everybody else in his class. He spent his the first week of his senior year living out of our Dodge Dart because we couldn't find a place to live until then. But um, I've lived out of. Uh, about six different Volkswagen buses, and my sister's, my sister bought a 1974 Super Beetle, red Super Beetle, that she later painted maroon. Um, she bought it new in 74, and uh, in 1989, she called me up and she said, uh, you want my car? If you do, you have to come and get it. I was in living, and it was the winter, and I was in, Cuba, in uh, on Cape Cod, and she was in Tampa, Florida, and her husband had just gotten orders to go to um, Germany. He used to run the uh, Central Command's computer in Tampa, Florida, and he got sent to Germany. And she had to pack up all her, her four kids and and follow them over there. And um, I had three days to get to where she was, so I packed my bag and I started hitchhiking. And I made it to Tampa, Florida in 26 hours. And I had her. I got her. Uh, got her Volkswagen Bug. Um, a couple hours before she got on the plane 
And I had that bug. I lived out of that bug for two, for two years, traveling around the country. And then um, she wanted it back when she came back from from Germany. And I bought my first uh, Volkswagen camper van, Westphalia, the green one with a diary green. And I had that for five years. And at the end of the five years, it, it communicated to me in no uncertain terms that it really wasn't going to make it out of the Florida Keys. And uh, so I was kind of stuck there for eight months, which is a whole other story. And uh, But the short story is... Um, this beautiful woman I was in love with, we had a dog in common, and she wanted to go to go to uh, hang out with Bob Marley's bass player and uh, in Jamaica, and she asked me to take care of the dog. So I met her in Key West, and we parted, and uh, I had the dog for eight months, and um, in the course of all that, the van broke down, I thought it was a scrap, and then I got it going again, but it wasn't going anywhere. And I had this friend who was a, uh, her best friend was, uh, was involved with uh, Jerry Garcia. And so they were all in that, you know, Grateful Dead. She wasn't really a groupie. She was more like, she looked like, Jackie Onassis, and she was from that same um, Philadelphia mainline uh, social circuit. And she, and she was, her demeanor was very similar to what we would think of as Jackie Onassis. I've never met Jackie Onassis, but she's very, very quiet, very, um, a woman of, of very few words, very, she had a very regal demeanor and lovely woman raising a single mother of at least two maybe three boys that were very Huck Finn-esque <laughs> running around getting into stuff living in Big Pine Key um, and she could she, she, she could grow some serious pot it didn't look like much but if you hit it man Powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. And, uh, and she made this really wonderful tea. Anyway, um, I gave her my bus, uh, and she, you know, cleared out all the all my refuse of five years of living in it, and uh, set it up as a as a uh, a guest room for her, you know, for anybody who came to visit. In her front yard, and her her boys. She told me. She told me her boys would. Um, they like to uh, pretend they were on a road trip in the bus, and they they, they called it. They were, they were out there playing hippie, <laughs> which is just about slayed me when I heard that playing hippie. They pretend like they're driving it and, and passing a joint between them and, you know, craziness. Um, and then I had my sister's bug for another two years until I ended up giving that away on a coin toss. I was actually going to drive it to the, uh, it had communicated to me that it was on its last legs or that we were not going to be going forward together. And I, I, I uh, had found this place near Santa Cruz, a, a junkyard called Moss Landing. And Moss Landing is, is right by the ocean. I thought, what a great place for it to just rust away, you know? Moss Landing. A fitting end to a car that had served our family well, and me personally, for at least four years of living out of it. And if you're wondering what is it like to sleep in a Volkswagen bug, um, you put the passenger seat forward, 
No, the driver's seat forward and the passenger seat back and you put all your clothes and stuff in that area in between and you put your feet by the, by the, uh, um, in the glove compartment and your head in the back and, you know, as a 5'10"-ish type person, you can just, you can get comfy. So I lived out of that bug for four years like that and traveled all over the country, scouted for rainbow gatherings and that. And uh, it served me well. And after that, I think I was, I didn't, ha I didn't own my own van, but I helped somebody else um, have a, this, my, my um, woman friend at the time, uh, she wanted a bus, so she got, she bought a bus and I helped her keep it going. Um, I dropped the engine out of that bus for her. Uh, she'd had it fixed. She had the engine rebuilt in Phoenix and drove it to LA and she knew there was something wrong with it and she called up the guy that had done the work and he said, well, if you can put it, have a friend take it out and put it on a pallet, I can have um, it, the pallet picked up because there's a trucking company where that's in the same place as his uh, car fixing business. And they, that's what we did. I, I pulled it out, put it on a pallet I found in the alley in Venice Beach. Um, they came and picked it up. Uh, he went and rebuilt the engine again. And three weeks later, he brought it back to me and I put the engine back in, which that was just a sentence. I put the engine back in just like, you know, I mean, it, 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 talk about simplification. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Simplification. But I put the engine back in. There on the street in the alley in Venice Beach. And, uh, you know, it was raining. I had the, the back of the, the engine, back of the van um, jacked up. And I had a, I had a floor jack. And I, I wheeled it in there and I, pump it up and get the engine up in into the into place and I, I'm trying to if there's these splines you've got to line them up and everything and I got it in there but it wouldn't go all the way in and I'm just I'm like Ugh. and right then this brother comes along he's like what are you up to I never met him before he's like what are you doing I said I'm trying to get this engine in there well, let me give you a hand and with the two of us was just shoved and shoved and shoved and finally got this engine in there in place you know and uh, that was what, 1990, 19, oh, no, no, that was 2000. Christmas, Christmas week, 2000. And uh, we've been friends ever since. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's how you know your friends. Somebody, a complete stranger just shows up when you're in the, your dire straits, getting rained on, getting frustrated and everything like that, just shows up, hey, let me give you a hand, you know, and does, and, and uh, yeah. Anyway, um, my next bus was a metallic blue uh, Vanagon, 1980. I had that for five years, drove around the country. I drove the bejeebas out of that bus until I had to give that away because it, it wasn't going anymore. That car, went, at one point, I was driving from Cape Cod to Burning Man to LA, and it broke down in every state west of the Mississippi, west of Indiana. It started breaking down in Indiana. It broke down at least five times a day. And I, I got it going, I got it going, made it to Burning Man, made it back to LA. Man. I've been stuck on the side of the road so many times with mechanical problems that I, I've given myself the, the title of a crisis mechanic. <laughs> 
you know, it's like, what do you do when you're in crisis? How do you handle it? And I can tell you that um, from my vast experience of being stuck on the side of the road, the number one thing that trips you up is not knowing what the fuck is wrong with your car. And it's the not knowing, because as soon as you have a clue, then you have, you know, then you have something to work with, right? But if you don't know what the problem is, it's the, the not knowing means it could be anything, right? Which is, which is a challenge if you don't have, um, uh, if you, if you have, you know, money, it's, it's a challenge because in that situation, your money can't do you, do any good for you, right? Um, if you're just stuck on the side of the road, it doesn't matter what your money is because the, the solution is to get to a place where you could have your money work for you, right? You still don't know. You're in the same boat as somebody that doesn't have any money. But back in the day, I didn't have any money. So on top of the fact that um, I don't know what's wrong with it, it's like nine times out of ten, it's going to require more resources than I have to fix, you would think. But... I'm here, I'm, you know, I'm alive, uh, which says that somehow, even though I was broke down in some of the stupidest places, the, the, the places that you, you would not want to be broken down, you know, the places, if you had, what's your top three places on the planet, or, or just in America, that you would not want to be broken down, right? I've been broken down in all those places. The Everglades. The Bonneville Salt Flats, right? Um, where's the other one? I don't know. Wherever it was, I was broke down there. <laughs> you know? I was stuck in the Everglades for two weeks. I had to drop the engine there, too, and put it back in by myself. And the same thing happened. Right as I'm trying to get it, get those splines lined up, some dude shows up and helped me wiggle it in crazy so when in all of those cars I I uh, you know lived out of them and you know traveled around the country and everything like that and we didn't have no van life hashtag <laughs> right we're just out there now. They have they have this term called boondocking, right? Like it's a a new thing. The idea is, I guess you you to go to go out into the wilderness by yourself with your vehicle and you know get your solar panels and your whatnot and your your Wi-Fi widget. You can get in touch with everybody and stay connected and you know. Uh, yeah, we didn't have any of that bullshit. So, um, and we didn't call it boondocking. We called it, uh, uh just getting the hell out. <laughs> just get, getting the hell out of Dodge, man. Getting away from all the noise. You know, why? So that we could, uh, just, um, listen to uh, the silence you know be in nature where um, you get to watch uh, things unfold naturally without any of the noise and confusion that we tend to bring and create especially other people's noise um, because every once in a while, I just, I just have to, I just have to, uh, be quiet. Let it all, let it all settle down. Every once in a while, I have to have a conversation with the universe. And it can be very challenging to hear that when 
you know, the world is in your face. So I, I go out into the wilderness all by myself with my, with my automobile. The good thing is, there's all these. There's always been these. Uh, the national forests and the Bureau of Land Management (BLM) lands. You know, there's rest areas. There's a couple of roads. My favorite roads in America are the PCH Pacific Coast Highway, Highway One goes from from Mexico to Canada along the coast and there are so many beautiful places along there where you can just pull over and and not be hassled and there's so many beautiful places along there where you can just pull over and be hassled um, you know where they you know the, the law will will uh, ticket you for uh, parking on the side of the road and and then there's Blue Ridge Parkway, which is 400 miles of highway that goes along the crest of the Appalachian Mountains through uh, Virginia and North Carolina. And there are all these pull-offs on both sides of the road. And each one of these pull-offs is you, you, you can see all the way to the horizon. You know, it looks like God's country. It's easily <clears throat> one of the most, the best roads in the world. And um, yeah. So when I see these the band life. Thing. I'm like, maybe part of it is, I want some. What is it that I want, though? I want, I want the recognition of all the suffering. <laughs> I want points. I want points for being there first. Uh, so I'm an OG fan lifer. And now, you know, 20 years ago, I was in uh, I was in Europe, and I saw these Mercedes vans, and I was like, that would be friggin' amazing to have in the states. And it took them, it took them what 10 years to get here, and another five for them to kind of kick in as worthwhile. And now they're ubiquitous. They're they're everywhere. And uh, a year ago this week, I was able to buy my own. And uh, finally, and the best part about it is I can stand up after all these years of you know five or six Volkswagen buses and having to be crouched over inside this one. I, I can actually stand on my head and. and In this video is because I'm, uh, I want to graduate from the petty resentments, all the petty resentments in my life, and uh, so I'm truth-telling on myself. Uh, envy can be a very um, self-defeating energetic structure and if you the best use of that energy is to to just go on about your business and do what it is that you really want to do for yourself 
and applaud those that are doing the same for themselves, right? Um, so that's the choice I'm making. Why do I want to be famous? I have always wanted to be famous for something really good. I wanted to be famous so that I could... Um, I want to be famous for changing the world for the better forever. And um, while I, I recognize that that is an easy thing to, to criticize, and, and there are those that always go for that low-hanging fruit, um, it doesn't... It, it doesn't change the fact that the emotional truth for me, that it feels like a fulfillment of my purpose in life to use that fame for, um, for good, to use that, to use fame for, to further my agenda. And my agenda is to you know, be the best version of myself and employ all of my talents and abilities to um, help make the world a better place. So that's what I've, that's why I wanted to be famous. I don't know what your reason is, but um, to that end, I've written a lot of books and painted a lot of paintings and made a lot of music and, you know, composed a lot of, uh, of music and um, uh, made several movies and cartoon series and, and painted t-shirts and what I wanted to be famous for, you know. And now I'm 63. I'll be 64 in uh, two months. And next month, end of August, August 26th. And I, um, to some people I may be famous, but to most people, no. And most people have no idea that I exist, nor do they have any idea that the work that I've done has been created or is available. And if I died in five minutes, most of my paintings would probably end up in a dumpster. Um, and the books would, you know, remain in obscurity, the, the music would be unlistened to, uh, because I haven't yet pushed it out there, um, it hasn't yet been discovered by the, the wandering eye of, of humanity, and, you know, those books, uh, there's eight novels, and most of the books are, have to do with metaphysics. Like, most people don't care about that. Most people don't, aren't even aware of the word and or the meaning of the word. And uh, it's not uppermost in their, their uh, mind. And, but it's uh, the center of my heart and existence was to try to articulate what that, that's all about. Um, and a lot of my work was designed for an audience, to interact with an audience, and that hasn't happened. You know, I, I started writing when I was 21, and, and now here it is, 63, so I've been writing for like 42 years. And I still haven't reached my audience. 
and you know the, the statistics are that it's very likely that I will not reach my audience right the chances of, of the work actually making a ripple in the fabric of human consciousness is uh, let's just say that the chips are stacked against me or at least against that happening and I'm not okay with that so I'm going to do everything that I can that's you know fun and legal to uh, turn that around in whatever days I have left on this planet and you know this is this is really come into sharp focus over the past two years as I have had several instances where um, there was a very, very um, strong possibility that I would be leaving the world pretty quickly. And um, fortunately, um, I was able to uh, turn that around, you know, so... It now looks like I'll be around a little while, while longer, uh, and I might. I feel like I, I, I best the best use of my time is to to dedicate to getting the work out there. And so, one of the first things that um, I would like to do is to. Examine what is fame, what is our relationship with fame as individuals and as a culture, and I had this idea of doing a, a fame podcast where I would interview people, not just not just famous people, but just regular people and ask them, you know, like, what did you, if you could be famous for anything, what would it be? And if, when you were a kid, did you think that you, did you ever think that you might want to be famous? And if so, what was that for? What, 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 what did you want to be famous for? And, uh, did you ever think about what, why you wanted to be famous? Like, what did you think that would do for you that you couldn't, have without that, right? So that's what I think is really fascinating, especially with people that actually achieve some sort of some measure of fame. Because um, it seems like for a, a lot of them, they never, they never, uh, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a goal, right? And then there's people like me who, who've had it as a goal and they, they don't reach that goal because um, it takes more than you having the goal. You know, it, it takes a certain amount of collective agreement in order for you to achieve your goal, you know? Just like if you're gonna be a, um, the quarterback of a team, um, it takes a certain amount of agreement for that team to agree that you're worthy of being their quarterback. So, thanks for listening. 